they are everywhere. We hear them rattle up and down the streets of our towns and cities. 480,000 of them. They have become almost invisible to us as they shuttle 26 million impressionable minds to our public schools every day. America's future is being shifted and remolded through our public school system. Tomorrow's voters and leaders are being guided and instructed in today's classrooms. But whose doctrine is being taught? The bus represents a story that has everything to do with where our nation came from and where it is going. This is a story of our children. This is the story of the big yellow bus. This is the story of indoctrination. Six years ago, we came together to pass the No Child Left Behind Act. And today, no one can deny its results. Stupid in America. That's a nasty title. 14 countries rank higher on reading ability than the U.S. And the urgent task of fixing America's failing schools. A third of our kids are dropping out. The American education system badly needs improvement. Just last week, schools got $10 billion in emergency government funding. But now the shocking video of a school beating caught on tape. There have been six suicides in our school district. Tampa police are investigating a report of a rape at Jefferson High School. Clearly one of the defining issues of our day, education has become a hot topic. People from every political persuasion are engaging in public debate, blaming the growing crisis in everything from teachers' unions to uninvolved parents or insufficient funding. Can the system be fixed? Or do we abandon it? Even the church seems divided over how to respond to the growing academic and moral threats in public schools. When you send that child off to school today, you're sending them into a pagan society. When you criticize the Word of God, criticize the Lord Jesus Christ, just degrade Christian faith altogether and teach those practices that the Bible states very clearly are ungodly, unacceptable, and condemned by God, that's what you're sending your child into. I don't think there's anything else that 90% of Christians do together same choice fight to the death over which bible you're going to use okay uh, what, what, which denomination you're going to be a part of duke it out there too but 90 percent make the exact same educational choice and nobody can point to book chapter and verse to justify it I move the passage of resolution number two on the secularization of our culture. Here we're watching a debate on the floor of the largest evangelical denomination in America. One side wants an exodus from the government schools, giving the highest priority to the purity and discipleship of their own children. Two years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention Council on Family Life reported that within a very short time of reaching the age of 18, in other words, finishing high school, leaving home, 88% leave the church not to return. I agree that we have a responsibility to make sure they are being taught the things of God, but that responsibility lies upon the moms and the dads of our home, and we cannot give the raise and the character of our children to the public schools. That's our responsibility. The other side wants just the opposite, an even greater involvement in the public schools, giving the priority to witnessing to the children of unbelievers. If we pull our children and godly teachers away from this world, then the darkness will completely overtake the schools and the hearts of our children will spoil as the salt is removed. Later that day, two influential Southern Baptist leaders took the stage. First, Al Mohler, head of one of the largest seminaries in the world, who is arguably the leading Baptist theologian in America. Teach your children, teach believers, teach followers of the Lord Jesus Christ the faith. They're not going to get it by osmosis. In his book, Culture Shift, he wrote, the time has come for Christians to develop an exit strategy from the public schools. I want to see. This is Franklin Graham, son of the famous Billy Graham. A child at least one child in every class in every public school in America who is trained as a witness for Jesus Christ. Let's don't surrender public schools. 
Let's take them back. This is the debate we need to settle, with sincere Christians on both sides asking, should we protect our children by withdrawing them from the public schools, or should we leave them in the system to try to influence the schools for the better? My name is Colin Gunn, and as a Christian homeschool dad born and raised in Scotland, there's plenty that I need to learn about the American school system to better understand this hotly contested issue. So my wife Emily and I thought we'd take the family on a little field trip from her native Texas all across the great USA. It's time to load up the guns and hit the road. We found the perfect bus on Craigslist. There's a surprising market for old school buses, primarily hippies, tailgaters, deer hunters, and of course, the occasional filmmaker. Colin, you've come by to to do some recording for your up and coming documentary indoctrination, and this is really the belly of the beast. When it comes down to it, you went after the public schools. Indeed, as a filmmaker, I have to go to other people to find out the truths, and we've been traveling around America in a big yellow school bus, which has been our, our theme for the movie. So you live in so, this thing? Yeah, well, we try not can, to. <laughs> we had to for three weeks, and we okay. traveled around America. But kids had a great time, and one of the things we like is there's an antithesis. We're ironically using the school bus, but showing the freedom and the liberty that you have as a homeschool family. We're just heading through Dallas. This will be fun for the whole family. Quite a trip in the bus at 60 miles an hour, uh, but uh, I think we're going to enjoy it. This is me at the age of five. Like most Scottish kids, I trotted off to school carrying my satchel to what would probably be the most life-changing event of my childhood. I had a fairly average experience at school. My unimpressive grades testify partly to a lack of personal motivation, but also I believe the school system's inability to inspire. Looking back at my public schooling brings back many memories, both good and bad. When I remember some of the bad things from those years, the bullying, the dreary classrooms, and even the bad influences of some of my peers, I start to think of the alternatives to public education that weren't readily available to my parents' generation. When Emily and I started having our own kids, we had to decide what we wanted to do for them. We wanted the very best for them. We wanted to raise them in the faith and protect them from some of the things we had been exposed to. So we decided to educate them at home. Now I know that parents who send their children to public schools love their children too and want the very best for them as well. But what is it that parents should expect by putting them on the bus today? It's a Scottish aspect of a marriage. Many of the people who are part of this project, like my wife Emily and Joaquin, my co-director, share very similar negative schooling experiences, even though we all have different backgrounds. But a recent graduate of the public schools might give us a fresh insider perspective. I attended public schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. I was in a very good school district. My high school was consistently ranked among the top 200 in the country. Emily spoke to a young lady from a Christian home who went to one of those great schools we've all heard about. My parents had always been involved in my education, even if it was, you know, just buying newspapers for me to read or buying books. And my parents said, we don't want you in the classroom for the lessons on homosexuality and AIDS. So I was one of two students out of 60 who got pulled out for that. But it didn't matter because, of course, we were all in the same class for the rest of the day. And I learned everything that had yes. been in there at recess. And by the end of fifth grade, um, most of my friends had had boyfriends. Even though our school was supposed to teach abstinence, in practice, that did not happen. Um, the closest we got was some people are abstinent before marriage. Now let's talk about what everyone else does. But by the time they get partway through high school, the stats show almost half 
will have had sex, many with multiple partners and many without a condom. Chancellor Dennis Walcott says the new curriculum will stress abstinence, but the reality is many don't abstain. There's four people pregnant this year, and then the next next week they'll be like, there's nine people pregnant this year, and then there was ten. School officials have their work cut out for them. They're now considering a plan to provide birth control services at the school in the fall. But their biggest challenge? How to change the mindset of some of the girls who come here. Sex in schools has become one of the biggest concerns for parents. The Provincetown School Department has approved a plan to distribute condoms in both the high school and the elementary school. Parents will not be told if their child requests a condom and they will not be allowed to prohibit their children from receiving one. They could say it, but we wouldn't honor it. A parent can't call and say, hey, I don't want my six-year-old to get a condom. And two... Six. Six-year-old. This is so crazy, it's hard to believe. And if you think this can't happen in your school, look at one of the creative ways in which Planned Parenthood is reaching out to children. Once upon a time, the infamous child catcher of Bulgaria used similar tactics to lure little children away from their parents. Here we are, children. Come and get your lollipops. Lollipops. Come along, my little ones. Lollipops. Sex in the schools has become so common, it's not just a problem amongst the children. According to the Department of Education's own nationwide investigation, Nearly 10% of public school students have been targeted with unwanted sexual attention by school staff. Most people have a hard time believing this could happen in their child's school. Until it does. That's everybody, by the way. Doesn't matter where they're from, doesn't matter who they are, their schools are different. It's what a lot of folks used to say, for example, in Port Natchez, Texas. And they pride themselves on their schools there in Port Natchez, Texas. You know, Port Arthur, Texas is real close to Port Natchez. Port Arthur, that's where those people live. You know, large numbers of blacks and Hispanics, poor people, that's where their schools are. Port Natchez is different. Port Natchez is pearly white. It's rather wealthy compared to Port Arthur. Their schools are different. It's true, which is why one of their principals of a Port Natchez elementary school was caught in a sting in the middle of a park soliciting boys for sex. He also happened to be a deacon at a local Port Natchez Baptist church. So I'm sure the parents there went around saying, our schools are different. Our principal is not only a Christian, he's a deacon. Good for them. I was shocked when I was 11 and I heard of someone in our middle school um, who I was talking with who had had an abortion. And I had only recently learned what an abortion was. Along with exposure to premarital sex, drugs are maybe the next biggest concern. According to a recent report, nearly half of all American high school students smoke, drink alcohol, or use illicit drugs. Drugs and alcohol became a problem in middle school, which I think is long before many parents even think to have a conversation with their children about when the legal drinking age is. If you doubt there are drugs in most American schools, just visit your local police station. Rough cluster of of some marijuana here, uh, prescription drugs, uh, pills are a favorite. They take them out of the parents' medicine cabinets. That's one stash from one high school seized in one day. A show of hands if you've ever known anyone to be high in school. Everybody. But then again, it's so hard to avoid it because it's so common now. And it's not just the illegal drugs that are concerning a lot of parents today. It's the drugs that the schools themselves are pushing on the kids, especially boys. After all, the ideal male in an American classroom is the one who sits still and behaves without showing any signs of his own masculinity. Author and attorney Bruce Shaw exposes some of these issues in his book, The Harsh Truth About Public Schools. Nobody really knows what the long-term effects of many of these medications are on young developing bodies and minds. What you have is probably the largest uncontrolled drug experiment in the history of the world. And I'm afraid that it's doing enormous damage, particularly to boys in the schools. And then there's the issue of school violence. I saw a gun on the bus for the first time when I was 12. I was in seventh grade. We were coming home from school, and a boy on my bus had a handgun, mm -hmm. which scared me to death. Mm -hmm. And this is in a public school that's ranked in the top 200 in the country. And on paper, I looked like a great product of the public schools. I was a national AP scholar. I did the International Baccalaureate program. 
graduated with very high GPA, but inside I was dying and I was absolutely spiritually broken by the time I graduated from 12th grade. So even in the good schools, the same problems of promiscuity, drugs, and violence all exist. A recent Gallup poll showed that 77% of parents give their child's school an A or a B performance rating, while 79% of Americans in general give the nation's public schools a C. In other words, everybody knows that the schools are terrible, but parents insist on believing that their child's school is doing better than most other schools. It's amazing to me that parents are willing to admit that there are these problems and yet believe that their children will somehow escape. They won't. If they end up being Christian after graduating from high school, that will be a real accomplishment in and of itself. At my high school, there was so much pressure to give up your Christian values if you happen to be Christian. I certainly never admitted I was a Christian in high school. And I told one person that I wasn't. And to my shame, I still have a hard time admitting that today. But I will admit that if it helps parents make the decision about where to send their children or how to educate their children. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. It also tells us that pure and undefiled religion involves keeping yourself unspotted from the world. All of us who have been to public schools know that within the confines of the playground, this is an impossibility. According to a study by the Barna Group, 61% of today's young adults who have been churched are now spiritually disengaged, i.e. not actively attending church, reading the Bible, or praying. The sad truth is that a vast majority of children from Christian homes will leave the faith. We don't lose them, we give them away. I met up with my friend, Pastor R.C. Sproul Jr. in San Antonio. He's a famous critic of the public school system. We're here in front of the Alamo. The Alamo is a, a symbol of American freedom, Texas freedom, of course. I'm a freedom-loving kind of guy. But, you know, what I'm thinking is if we surrender our children, then to the public schools, what does all the rest of it matter? Freedom in the end isn't about having guns, having money, having houses. Freedom is about raising our children to serve the Lord Jesus. All of reality exists so that God's name would be known. And the government school says you can't name his name. They are forbidden by law to publicly and clearly state that Jesus Christ is Lord. You get the salt and light argument from folks who, who have their children in government schools. It's not working. If, if, if we send out evangelists and they become unbelievers, we're not following a biblical strategy. But to proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the government schools will get you thrown out, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, or a child. How did this happen? There must be some Christian influence in the schools. I decided to drive down to Austin for the Texas Teacher of the Year Awards and ask Christian teachers how their faith affects their testimony in the schools. This is the Texas Teacher of the Year event, so we're going coming here to do some interviews with some teachers, hopefully. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. So what's the, what's the conflict in public schools about being you know, a Christian and being able to talk about the Christian faith. Uh, are you able to do that in your classroom or is it I difficult? I think to demonstrate it is even more important or as important as talking. I think the best way to teach Christianity in school is through example. Teaching students that uh, there's a positive way to live life and uh, an ethical way to live life. These interviews were helpful. They represent what many teachers are trying to do in the schools. They know they can't be explicit about their faith, so they seek to lead by example. This is good, but isn't godly living only half of our responsibility? Didn't Jesus command us to boldly confess his name before men, regardless of the consequences? The declining trend in the public schools seems to demonstrate that godly example by Christian teachers has maybe slowed the decay, but their subtle expressions of faith are certainly not reversing the downward trend. I needed to talk to someone who could potentially have more influence as a Christian in the public schools. We had heard of an elementary school principal in Pennsylvania. I wanted to know how he was able to be salt and light in the public school he had chosen to serve in. When I gave my life to the Lord, I was in technical sales, a very, very cutthroat industry. And I, I got to the point where I really said, is this, is this what God wants me to do? 
So when a Christian said to me, you, you have what I see as this gift with, with working with children, uh, have you ever thought about that? It was something that hit me like a brick, and, and I thought, wow, yeah. So now I'm an elementary principal, chief cook and bottle washer. It's a small school. We're always in the top 10%. We're a national blue ribbon school through the Department of Education. Uh, we have people that come to us and say, yeah, we're, we're coming here because you're the top school in the state, and this is where we want our kids to go. I asked them, how exactly are you being salt and light as a Christian and as a principal of a government school? I do have a, a conflict at times between God's law and man's law. I'm in front of the dike, and there are pinholes and cracks starting in the dike. And what I'm doing with the Anti-Defamation League, I put my finger in that little hole and I stop it. And what I'm doing with after school uh, with the program for Good News Club, putting my finger in that hole and stopping it. And now I'm standing here holding back the water up here, but yet I'm realizing I look down and the whole foundation of the dike is crumbling out from under me because the foundation's not built upon God, not built upon His Word, not built upon His truths. It's built upon man, man's desires, man's wants. So I'm on shaky ground, and I, I have a hard time with that. Yes, in the morning we do pledge the flag and have a moment of silence, and in that moment of silence, I pray, I make sure that I'm out where other people can see me and I am bowing my head and I am praying. Really that's the only area anymore that God is in the schools. Even as a principal, it can still be a struggle to be salt and light in the schools. It seems he's not alone in this struggle. I come from a line of public school educators. My mom is a public school teacher as well as both my grandmothers and both of my great-grandmothers. Sarah is the kind of teacher Christian parents would want their child to have. She is a believer, she's kind, and she loves her students. She's doing what a lot of Christians are doing, trying to be salt and light to her young students. But she was honest about the difficulties. The public school system culture as a whole is overwhelmingly anti-Christian. Um, the teachers, I've heard teachers say things to students that are directly anti-Christian. There was an incident where students were um, calling each other gay on the playground. And a teacher addressed, handled that situation by telling the students that, well, that's okay and you don't know you might be gay. Um, you don't know yet. Most people don't find out until they're older. And she was telling this to eight-year-olds. And so as a Christian, this was very difficult for me to listen to and to hear that. Do parents know about these kinds of incidents in their children's school? Parents, they want to think that their teachers are doing good, but they don't know what really goes on inside of the classroom. And while the public school system teaches morals, we've, we're told that that's the most important thing that we teach, that that is the plate that all of the subjects, everything else goes on. But what the public school system has done is taken Christ out from the morals. And so they've taken the foundation that the morals are based on away. I asked Sarah about her struggle to be faithful to Christ in the public schools. I can't tell the students about God, I can't give him glory for anything. Just the other night we had um, open house, we had parent night, and I have never felt so ashamed as a Christian as I did standing in front of those parents and presenting to them our plan, our school year, and I felt like I was making them feel good about their decision to place their child in the public school. I was reassuring them that they're in a, a good place when I don't believe that. When someone is teaching them and standing in front of them in a position of authority and telling them that the earth is however many million years old or telling them things that go directly against what the Bible teaches and their parents are sending them to this place, they, they are learning, okay, my parents must not really believe this. Okay, the Bible must not really be the word of God because 
my teacher who I like and who is, seems to be a good person is saying otherwise. Surely there must be something she can do to help her students. If I talk about my faith the way I want to, I know that I'll lose my job. How long would your career last if you were to start um, teaching scripture from the front of the classroom? <laughs> I'd probably be out of here that day. Would she really get in that much trouble? A teacher is in trouble for bringing a religion into his classroom, but should he lose his job? The school board is hearing arguments at this hour. We have a live report. Can we profess Christianity and at the door of a public school leave his name behind in everything that we do, knowing that we're teaching, knowing that we're imparting knowledge when the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge? That was a big question, and I wrestled with it, and I came under so much conviction, felt like I was grieving the Holy Spirit, knowing that there were so many instances where I did fail. It just came to the point where I couldn't do that anymore. Mr. Ziegler experienced firsthand what it felt like to be called into the principal's office for misbehaving. Religious expression clashes with academic policy in Papillion. A high school math teacher accused of discussing his religious beliefs in the classroom could see his career at Papillion end tonight. KETV News Watch Evans Todd Andrews is standing by live at the school board meeting that will decide the teacher's fate. Todd brings us tonight's big story. Teacher Robert Ziegler is facing dismissal for discussing Christianity in his math class. There's some liberty um, when it comes to talking about religion in the classroom. If, if teachers are asked questions, they answer those questions. Apparently, Ziegler is not without his supporters. A small but vocal group of students began speaking out after his suspension was made public. I haven't heard of one kid who didn't support him or even like had a problem with him. I don't really think he should should have gotten too much trouble. They should have gave him a warning. I don't think it's right. Tonight, he faces an uphill battle. He's chosen to represent himself in what amounts to an in-house jury trial. In Acts 4, Peter and John were in a similar trial and were told not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Their answer, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That verse right there solidified in my mind that I was going to teach what was honoring to God. I was going to teach in my classroom in a way that if God was my supervisor, he'd be pleased with me, not any man. Not only are teachers being censored, outspoken students also often receive the same treatment. His love is that something more we all desire. It's unprejudiced, it's merciful, it's free, it's real, it's huge, and it's everlasting. God's love is so great that he gave up his, gave up his only son Brittany's microphone was abruptly silenced. She was prevented from finishing her valedictorian speech because of Christ's name. The school had no problem with a God. They just didn't want to hear about the one true God. Kicked out of class for quoting the Bible, a Racine High School student gets sent to the principal's office for talking about Jesus. These elementary school children were handing out candy canes at school, for instance, or pencils that said, Jesus is the reason for the season, that kind of thing on them, the principals took them away and said, hey, this is a public school, you can't be exhorting religion here. We've been getting a lot of feedback from our viewers about the Papillion La Vista math teacher who was fired last night. The school board decision is generating a lot of comments on our website. One viewer defends the teacher. He says maybe if we had a little more respect for our creator, we would have less problems in the world today. I, for one, find our creator more useful than 95% of the math being taught today. So what were Robert Ziegler's three strikes? Insubordination, unprofessionalism, and neglecting my duties as a teacher, those three things. The real reason, I believe, was conveyed about midway through the trial when a principal said this, if Robert would stop saying the name Jesus, we would welcome him back into the classroom even at this point. But he has communicated that he will not stop saying the name of Jesus. And so, you know, many things were said about why they were terminating me, but I believe it simply came down to Jesus. Hi. How did I get to Manhattan from here? All in tunnel. I had an opportunity to meet one of the most important public school whistleblowers of our era. 20 years ago, he walked away from the teaching profession for good. This was no ordinary teacher. 
This was a 30-year public school veteran, so accomplished within the teaching profession, he even won the New York City and New York State Teacher of the Year awards back to back. Why would someone so successful in a profession want to speak so boldly against it? I had to hear his story 